Thank you very much. That's wonderful. That's the best introduction I've had today. So that's uh, welcome. Uh, you missed my introduction. My name is Corey Matthieson. Okay, no, okay, that's fine. Um, so today we're talking about the feasibility and reproducibility of this awesome technique that we developed to measure skeletal muscle blood flow and oxygen saturation. So we're trying to figure out the muscle oxygen consumption while someone is exercising in an MRI. Just by show of hands, who here has had an MRI before? Okay. Who here understands how MRIs work? Okay, cool. Very right right nice. Who here um, is totally brand new to biomedical engineering? Yeah, cool. Right on. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and enjoying the talk. And if there are questions at the end uh, of any uh, sort of understanding or skill level, please bring those up because those are good to challenge me and hopefully uh, inform and educate you. So, um, just as some background on MRI. MRI is measuring the protons, the water that's in your body. Your body's 60 to 70 percent water, and each proton in your body acts like a little tiny small magnet, right? And the, how that actual, the image appears, it's an imaging technique, so we're trying to get image contrast. How that image appears depends on a few things. The concentration of water in that imaging slice, it's a three-dimensional imaging slice of volume. Uh, whether or not those protons are moving, and then there might be other factors like whether or not the blood is oxygenated or deoxygenated. That's a particular contrast that I'll be looking at in my technique. Right. So there are three steps to acquiring an MRI image. The first thing you need to do is prepare the signal. Uh, these little protons, you need to prepare them. So you have all these protons floating around in your body like that. You apply the static main magnetic field, we call B0, just nomenclature and MRI. And then after that, everything is pointing in the same direction. It's like how a compass works, it always points towards north, unless you're in, you know, the, uh, what's the Bermuda Triangle, or unless you're, you know, uh, screwed flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Everything is aligned to the main magnetic fields uh, on the Earth. Anyone know what movie this is from? Let me ask. Yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean, wow, a couple points. Oh, it's okay, yeah. <laughs> Is it you? Yeah. I knew it was you, yeah. <laughs> My nemesis that beat me yesterday. <laughs> uh, the second step uh, we need is to excite the sample with radio waves. So we apply radio frequency just like your cell phone has or radio towers have, and then all of those little spins start swinging around just like a gyroscope. Anyone play with a gyroscope? You know that you can like make it do some awesome cool things where it processes while it's spinning in between. Uh, to, to help it to balance. So now we've excited, um, aligned everything, and then we get uh, the radio waves out of those protons by listening with another RF antenna. So you can have all sorts of different antennas. You can have a head coil, a body coil, you can have a surface coil over here. We use a surface coil, particularly in the technique we're using. This is what an MRI looks like if you've never ever seen one before. This is like a sexy one with nice mood lighting. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of MRI. Advantages are it's non-invasive, it's uh, super easy, you get a lot of really good image contrast from different tissues. Disadvantages are it's not available everywhere, sometimes there are big weight lines, uh, the cost is prohibitive for some research centers. So those have to be balanced and mediated. Also, you have to build techniques for MRI. It's like a DSLR camera where you can write different techniques and imaging protocols. Like you can make it capture whatever you want, but you might need some pre-existing uh, knowledge to write those techniques. So, what are the motivations behind our particular study? Well, we want to measure blood flow and oxygen saturation in the blood in a main muscle group so that we can get muscle oxygen consumption. Yeah, We need to get the oxygen extraction in a muscle to see how well that muscle is working. Now, we need a robust method to understand this because it's going to tell us a whole bunch about the disease state that someone is in or the training state that someone who's healthy is in. So the goal of our study specifically is to uh, evaluate this new technique that we've built that interleaves a flow imaging and an oxygen saturation imaging technique. And we're doing it with dynamic exercise. So VO2 is oxygen consumption. It's uh, a product of two different things. One is the flow of blood to that muscle. One is the saturation difference between fully saturated blood and fully desaturated uh, venous blood, or partially desaturated venous blood, depending on how hard you're actually working or exercising. CA is a constant that's dependent on the carrying capacity of oxygen. Uh, men and women have different hemoglobin levels, and hematocrit levels may vary. 
so that constant will be uh, calculated for each individual. This sort of describes what I've just said. And uh, so what we need particularly is to query these two variables. One is the flow, the other is the Venus saturation. How can we do that? Well, we need uh, to measure flow with a complex difference analysis. So what we're doing is utilizing the phase difference between flowing protons. I said that the flowing uh, of those protons can give us differences uh, or contrast that we can measure with MRI. And we need to measure the saturation in the venous blood, SVO2. And we do that with a method called susceptometry. And that gives us contrast based on the shielding or not as much shielding between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood or hemoglobin in that blood. Yeah. We also have a few assumptions that we make. We assume that uh, the extraction reflects quadricep muscle uh, extraction. So the blood that's flowing here, we're isolating to the quadricep muscle, which may or may not be true, but studies have shown that it's a very good estimate, and it's been used, single leg knee extension has been used as an exercise paradigm to measure what's happening in that quadricep. We're also assuming that one second post-exercise, that window post-exercise, gives us an understanding of what is happening at peak exercise, right? So, where are we in the body? This is a pelvic girdle. These are the femurs coming down. And we're trying to query in the femoral vein right here. This is the femoral vein. This is what it looks like through this slice. And here are the femoral arteries. You can tell that they're dark because that's a saturation pulse that we apply that cancels out all of the signal on the arterial side because we just want signal on the venous side. We also have a 3D model. This shows uh, the venous sort of structure, and we're trying to query above this level because we don't want contributions from the saphenous vein because that's superficial on the leg. Uh, also, it's important to note that this angle, theta, is the angle between uh, the vessel and that main magnetic field, that main B0, that you can imagine was deflecting that compass or your protons. So, the real-time complex difference is going to measure the flow and how do we do that? We do it uh, over a series of time points with 60 millisecond temporal resolution. And then we have each of these 40 different time points. We average up over this area, which is the vessel area. And there are no signal contributions from anywhere else because we've nicely saturated the, uh, the arteries. There's an equation that governs the complex difference that we can all read. And uh, importantly, we have a, con a calibration signal that we need for each time point, for each time point, which is 2.4 seconds, averaged over these temporal windows. And then we can get out a value of flow. Yeah? If, there, if that's not clear, we can ask questions about complex difference afterwards. Important to mention the saturation. And now so cytometry, which measures the saturation of oxygen in that vein. It gives us a nice, beautiful map like this that shows us how much oxygen is in that vein uh, in comparison to muscle tissue and fat, which is sort of the garbage of this image. And uh, we're working to cancel out that fat. So there's an equation that governs the symptometry too, and it looks a little bit like this. The important point is that we're getting a phase difference, this delta phi, over a time difference, delta E, and that gives us some contrast, some difference in phase because of the difference in oxygenated versus deoxygenated hemoglobin. There are some important uh, assumptions that we make as well. One is that it has to be a cylindrical vessel. Luckily, the majority of vessels in your body that are main feeding uh, veins are cylindrical. Also, we assumed a hematocrit uh, in this study. And this is the susceptibility difference between deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. That's been validated in studies previously. This is what it looks like if you were such a nice volunteer to come and volunteer for my study. I would strap you to the MRI bed, and then you'd go into this tube head first with your legs sticking out. And you're going to be doing exercise like this, kicking a big mass that's coupled, and it just hangs there. Everyone's done a basic kinematics course, dynamics course, yeah. So it's a simple equation that governs how much work they're doing. We estimate it to be about five watts. So it's an absolute workload for everyone. So we have nine healthy male subjects in our first pilot study. They did two minutes of this kicking exercise at 50 revolutions per minute. And then we do pre and post exercise imaging. Uh, and then we retest again after 10 minutes once their body has come back down to a neutral resting state. 
The targeted parameters are, of course, peak values of flow, oxygen saturation, and then that VO2, which is calculated with that equation previously. And then we're also modeling the rate of recovery of VO2, which is an important dynamic in physiology. Thank you. So here are some uh, important MRI um, parameters. The important note here is that the temporal resolution is 2.4 seconds. So uh, we interleave flow and oxygen saturation imaging, just like that paradigm shows. Uh, important results I'll now get into. There are uh, very similarities between the muscle mass and vessel angle. The saturation is very similar uh, in the arterial side. Then this shows the test versus retest, and we show that there's very good reproducibility between uh, test and retest in flow. Um, you can read the numbers there for coefficient variation. Here's the oxygen saturation. There's very good uh, reliability between test and retest, and with a larger coefficient of variation because the optometry is a little bit more variable. And then here's our VO2 with, that shows test and retest in good agreement, and then we model it with that curve to get out the tau, which is our recovery time constant. And that's important, that phys physiological parameter. Yeah? This is co uh, comparison to previous invasive studies. The gold standard would be invasive if you could actually get a needle in there, pull out blood, and actually query the parameters while, that, uh, while that's exactly happening. We don't want it to be invasive. That's why we developed a non-invasive way. And comparisons with invasive show really good agreement within our standard errors. So in conclusion, it gives us sufficient temporal resolution and also helps us model that rate of recovery curve. And there's a broad potential applications for this in terms of targeted therapies, so that we're targeting just flow when flow needs to be improved, or just uh, saturation when uh, the specific mitochondrial oxygen extraction needs to be queried. Uh, so it's good for disease states and also, <coughs> thank you, <laughs> healthy training. Uh, that's it, thanks, and I'll happy to answer any questions. Okay. Sorry, I know I went Yeah? So, infrared can also be used to find oxygen. Say again? Infrared technology? Infrared. Yes, yeah, great. So, that is much cheaper than MRI. Much, much cheaper. There are some important disadvantages to infrared spectroscopy. So, NEARS is a superficial application of an IR. Uh, the sender and the receiver, and you can imagine that the distance, the penetration depth, is limited. So you can't get down to the deep femoral vein. So you can't query main muscle groups with nears. There's no means by which you can do it. You can do it in superficial veins, which is why the majority of nears studies, or near infrared spectroscopy studies, do it in the forearm, where all your veins are just like hanging out super close to the skin. So I couldn't understand why you just in because we want a uh, main muscle group, because that is a good uh, correlate to whole body exercise capacity. It's a good means by which we can measure like someone's full fitness and exercise capacity. We couldn't do that if it was just this exercise, which is what they do on years. Because some people would just have really strong forearms if they, I don't know, dance a lot or whatever. <laughs> That's a good question. But yeah, Nears is much cheaper though. Yeah. Um, how did you handle moving artifacts after the exercise? I'm assuming that even though it's only the one point, something would misalign. Yeah. So, yeah. That's good. So we, our imaging window is small enough so that we can capture uh, it clearly and cleanly each image. I have a video that wasn't included in this that shows the relaxation of the muscle. As you can imagine, after you kick a bunch, then relax, all those muscles start to relax and swing down into a relaxed state. But we're querying each image. So uh, it's image by image we get a value out. So that blurring doesn't really affect us because our imaging window is so short. Yeah. Yeah? Do you like your slide where you have your error bars for the comparison to the tool stand? Sure. So uh, the blue data is from a paper. Is that right? The blue data is from a paper. Yeah, Anderson, this is the invasive study. So what's their error bar? What is our error bar? What's their error bar? Their error bar is hard to say because we extrapolated the data down to five watts. We okay. don't have the raw data, so it's hard to get patient by patient uh, to be able to see. Did not the Not in that study. So what's the biggest contributor to your error bar? That's a great question. 
So the main contributor to our error is the correction that we do for the main uh, magnetic field difference, the phase shift in that background magnetic field. So we see some phase perturbations and we have to correct for that. So that's like we need to move on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. That's the end. Okay. <laughs> right now, thank you very much.